We've all heard, of course, about electrification of the auto fleet, but what about the work fleet? Uh, Gary, what you've done here is really amazing, a multi-purpose vehicle. Why don't you kind of describe what we're looking at, and we'll have a conversation about what you're doing. Sure. So what we've taken, and we've been working on this um, proof of concept, started seven years ago, and we're into our fourth generation, but we really have a great collection of work machinery components, uh, mechanicals, hydraulics, electronics, uh, components and systems that have been in the industry for decades. Uh, the only thing we've really introduced is a brand new design and architecture and, and packaging uh, to put all those in this multi-capable um, um, format so that the work attachments can go on either end. Uh, work tools that are already in the marketplace. And instead of using an internal combustion engine and liquid fuels, we're using uh, transportation, high voltage and car transportation batteries. So we use multiples of those, anywhere from three to 12 different uh, packs are on board to make sure that you have you know, a full day's work to uh, do, doing whatever work is uh, needed. You know, it could be agriculturally, at an airport or marine port, certainly in the city, the urban, uh, for um, you know any maintenance work. This is called trenching, asphalt planing, tree spades, augers, backhoes, all of that work machinery that has traditionally been uh, diesel powered is now available electric. Yeah, you said it's a half a megawatt, but what's really fascinating, it's really kind of a Swiss army knife platform, so it can adapt to be one thing in the morning and another thing in the afternoon, right? Well, that was the that was the purpose of it. Um, it's great that it can carry a lot of power and export that power in emergency situations, but really, it's being able to configure the power to do whatever is needed on Tuesday and then on Wednesday, and just completely reconfiguring that. The fleet manager can do that, you know, on an as-needed basis. And it uh, it really changes the return on investment because you're not looking at that single-purpose use, right? Correct, and that concept's been asked for for probably 20 years by fleet managers. They've always had to have a one of just about everything, just a requirement for seasonal use alone. Um, what they would really look and look for and prefer is, is one vehicle that's working every day, and they just put different attachments on, different work tools to do the different work. And what's uh, really fascinating is it's a, a platform that is much lower maintenance because it is electric, right? That's right. It's uh, electric, so there's no transmission and there's no fluids. Um, we've heard all about, um, you know, electric cars, how low in maintenance they are with brakes and transmission and radiators and all of that stuff you don't have on electric vehicles. So it becomes very low maintenance. And from an energy grid standpoint, you mentioned some interesting applications like the uh, no grids uh, farm application. Sure. So, you know, being backup power is, is the first and uh, foremost because that's what we're faced with. The grid is very much at its limit. But then there's applications that don't have a grid and they have relied on diesel generators. And that no longer is really looked at as a good option because of the, uh, the, the pollution and the environmental impact. So with a vehicle like this, you can have distributed energy. It can actually show up and supply energy up to a half a megawatt, or you might have two or three of these that are tethered together, and you really have enough electric you know, energy uh, on pl in place to run a microgrid or run a city block or run, run whatever operation needs the power. Yeah, in your case, you're giving an example of a well out in the middle of a field in Texas or somewhere, right? Exactly, so you know the farming community you know, hundreds of thousands of acres, there's not a grid out there, it's an agriculture setting, and they've relied on diesel uh, generators and diesel irrigation pumps. And in some sensitive areas and valleys, uh, those diesel generators and diesel irrigation pumps are now being banned because of the emissions. So this can actually show up and provide electric power to do that same task now. And conceivably, you could put some autonomous uh, functionality on here and the farmer wouldn't have to go out there and do that, right? Oh, that's exactly right. That's one of the first things they look for. I mean, work machinery has always been about replacing manual labor. And so uh, they just take it another step further when they realize this is a connected vehicle. GPS knows where it's at. We know where it's at. Everybody's monitoring it. It's an easy step to just let it go out to where it needs to work autonomously. 
And so one of the things that drew me to your company and your story, we're here in Silicon Valley at Prospect SV, nice uh, fall day, but you uh, hail from Indiana and you have to look at things a little bit differently. Why don't you tell us about the roots of the company and, and where you're going? So central Indiana is um, to not a lot of people, but it's known for electrification. At turn of the century, back in the 1900s, I mean, that was really the birthplace of a lot of electric cars and, and has continued to be the birthplace of uh, a lot of things electrical, whether it be batteries or starter motors, windshield wiper motors, alternators, goes on and on. And, you know, Navy has a Navy base out in the middle of Indiana, Crane Navy Base, great battery lab. They invented and engineered uh, batteries for electric submarines back in World War II. So that's, that's our home. Uh, that's where we are. So we're familiar with electrification. Um, but we're also an agriculture community, and we have places like Indianapolis. So we, we see the military application need, the urban city center, and also the rural agriculture need. And so this vehicle was designed to cover all those bases electrically. And it's GSA approved, and you've been doing work with the DOD, right? That's correct. Yes, we're on the GSA contract, and, um, been, and DOD is very familiar. We've been on a lot of air bases and marine bases. This is exactly the kind of distributed energy that they're looking for and that they use. Now, the fans we heard a little bit earlier, just before we go, I want you to talk to what we were listening to. Uh, yeah, many of the systems are very much automated, and, and so all of the batteries are thermally cooled, liquid cooled, both heated and cooled. So as battery power is exported, uh, it generates its own need for cooling fans, and those will come and go. All of the systems are waterproof and submergible to four feet. So, um, you know, this can go underwater. Um, obviously, it has air-to-air -air, uh, heat exchangers. It's all automatic. Excellent. Well, Gary, I appreciate your time, and good luck with this as you move it forward. Oh, great. Thank you, Ken.